few words, everybody knows Roger, but let me give you a few words about, about his background before we turn it over to him. Roger was born a, in, a native of G G Gatesburg, Illinois, and graduated from Western Illinois University in 1972. He was in education. I guess you were a teacher for a number of years, right? Or principal or something in the administration in the school. And then he came to us in 2003 as a director of golf and then became the, pre the president in 2005. So he's been here getting on to 20 years. Roger, is, we're losing light, president of the Kiowa Island Golf Resort elected to serve as the 34th president of the PGA of America from 2004 to 2006, and is a member of the PGA Golf Professional Hall of Fame. Roger, it's all yours. Thank you. Can you all see me up here? OK. I just want to start with that first. I am going to give you a vision test a little later up here to see if you can see the cursor. Don't worry, I don't even think you people up front will be able to see it, but that'll be the vision test. I want to th thank um, the people with the uh, Our World presentation for, again, asking me to come here to make a presentation to all of you. I, I was thinking about it, I've done it before, but I don't think I've ever done it coming out of a period um, that has been so challenging for all of us. Um, and we've all experienced different kinds of challenges during this time, and uh, we've had to respond to it in, in our own ways, but I think that part of what I'm going to share with you today is what the challenges have been for the resort. I'm going to uh, try to follow this outline. Um, following this welcome, I'm going to talk about you know, what has transpired through this pandemic period to our business at the resort and what implications that has for now and in the future and, and the impact of the, uh, the resort on the island going forward. Um, I know that there's a lot of interest in what we have left to develop on the island um, and uh, I'll try to give you as much information as I can that I have that I'm allowed to. I still work for a board of directors who tells me what I can say and can't say about certain items. So I'll tell you what I know because I still want this job. <laughs> um, I'm going to say it right up front too because I, I want to take away the question at the end when somebody stands up and said, I heard you're retiring. When are you retiring? I'm not. <laughs> I have no plans to retire and that's because I really enjoy what I'm doing and I think you retire to do something that you don't, that you haven't been able to do while you're working. I've got a pretty good life. I've got a great wife, and I think she likes it when I walk out the door in the morning. <laughs> and she likes it when I walk back in at night, and we have a great relationship. So I have no plans right now, but like anybody's life, your life can change and you make a different decision, but I have no plans right now. So I know that that's been a rumor for a few years. The rumor was, well, right after the PJ Championship, he's going to retire. Probably would have been a good thing to do, but I didn't do it, so we're going to move on with that. We, um, we live in a very unique place in this country. I feel that I personally am blessed to be able to call this home, because I think that there are very few places that I've been around the country that has the feel that you get when you pull onto this island. It's special. And it's not a mistake that it's special. There have been a lot of people over the history of this island who've worked very hard to create an experience that all of us who come later have a responsibility, I believe, to foster it as it is and to make it better as we go forward. So that's the role, I think, that the resort plays here on the island. This is a resort island. It was designed to be a resort island. We are the only major commercial entity in the town of Keough Island, on the island. And we understand that, and we accept and respect the role that we have to play to make sure that it maintains the status that it has, the feeling that it has, 
the experience that it provides. We're successful as a business because we make a promise in our advertising, in our marketing, in our day-to-day -day exposure with our guests. We make a promise that we're going to deliver an exceptional experience to the people who come here. Now for that, we get to charge an exorbitant amount. <laughs> and the minute that we don't deliver on that, then we'll get challenged on it. And we do get challenged on it periodically. And many times, uh, you know, if, if we're the problem, we'll fix it. And if we're not, we'll still smile and try to figure out a way to make people feel better. We're not in the business of um, dealing with people in a way that isn't a positive way, frankly. That's what we train our staff to do. That's what they work hard to do. We supervise them. We pay them to do that. And we're blessed to have a great staff. I'm going to talk about them in just a second. And so we're also very protective of our staff. We want to make sure that in their relationships with guests, that guests who choose to um, belittle or criticize verbally or be objectionable to our staff, we won't tolerate it. They need to know that we have their back. They need to know that we respect what they're doing and we know their intention we know that they're not perfect, and we know we can resolve any conflict if people will talk about it rather than yelling about it. So that's our goal, that's our philosophy, and that's how we try to work through day to day with our business. How many of you have only been here for the last five years? How many have been here for 20 years? Yeah, yeah me too, okay. So we've seen a lot together. Those of you who've been here you know, in the last five years, as we've seen a lot of transition on the island. We've seen a lot of home sale in the last year and a half to two years. We've seen a lot of new people come in. It is having an impact on our business, and it's having an impact on people's expectations. We're working hard to let new people who come in understand what we do and how we do it. And we think that's important. And, um, so some of what we're going to talk about, some of what I'm going to show, some of you have probably seen it before, but I want to make sure everybody that's here that may not gets to see um, what the resort has done over the past eight to ten years. You all know that we are, the resort is owned by a family. It's a private family-owned business. The Goodwin family out of Richmond, Virginia. The patriarch of the family is Bill Goodwin, William Goodwin the Jr. and he and his family sit on the board with a couple of independent directors with them and they have a generational commitment to this resort. They have a number of holdings. They have a number of operating companies. They continually reinforce that this is a company and an operating entity that they have that they intend to stay in through the next generations that come through the family. And as they prepare for that generational transfer of power, the next generation takes over the leadership of the board, takes over the leadership of the companies, all of that they're going through right now. And um, they're doing a great, great job of it. It's taking a little more time, but any of you who've been involved with those kinds of companies and family companies and that generational change, more of them fail at it than do it successfully. So to move through successfully this will be in itself a big win. So let's go to the resort business. This is a comparison just in percentages of what our business has done since 2019, pre-pandemic. Our hotel leisure room nights in 21 last year, we were up 47% over the highest number of room nights we've ever had. 47%. And this year we're budgeting of leisure are the transient people. That I never, we try not to use the word transient because it sounds negative, but it's just compared to group. They come and go on their own, groups come together, if you want to understand the, the transient term. But leisure is more like, okay, people who are coming here for vacations, families, so forth. So in 2022, that's dropping to a 21% gain, but you'll see that um, the group business is starting to come back. 
We had basically no group business in 20. When we, one of the saddest days of my life was April 4th of 2020, when I had to lay off 100, 1,100 people from their jobs. Now we, to the, the family's credit and the business credit, we made sure that everybody was whole, giving them all of their um, vacation pay, their sick pay, um, doing, uh, carried them on our medical insurance from the time they were off as they were able to get uh, the uh, unemployment that was offered by the federal government. We did not take PPP funds. Our ownership did not feel that it was appropriate for a private entity as successful as we were to use those PPP funds that somebody else who would need it more should get it, so we didn't take it. So our business this year, the group business is coming back. We had budgeted for about 22,000 group rooms in the sanctuary. The numbers probably won't mean anything to you, but we've already got 31,000 on the books for the year in April. So we've had a great growth in group rooms, but because we have more of those group rooms in the rooms, we'll have room for fewer leisure rooms. And so um, the upside to that is that by the laws of supply and demand and yield, our prices go up for those rooms. So that's a, that's a good thing from my perspective. Maybe not to everybody who wants a room, but it's a good thing. Um, villa and home um, transient rooms. We're up 44% uh, in 21, and we'll only be up 35% compared to 19 this year because one of the things that's transpired in the um, what we call short-term rental program, our villa program is a program that we manage. We manage homes and villas for people who want to put rentals in there. Um, three years ago, we had about 510 units on our program. Now we've got about 410. We've lost 100 units because people who were buying those units, many of them either want to live there year-round, don't want to rent it, or they've decided to rent it themselves or go to other rental agencies. They'll be back, but we'll have to wait for them to figure that out. <laughs> um, and so that's why that, uh, that number is lower. Let's talk about the Governor's Club. How many of you are Governor's Club members? Wow. Thank you for being Governor's Club members. Um, we had a 45% increase, 44% increase in Governor's Club members in 2021, last year. We ended the year with, um, well, we have 200 people waiting on a waiting list to get in for golf, the golf memberships. We went to a waiting list last year in March. We went to that waiting list because we couldn't, in good conscience, continue to take members in when we knew we had difficulty getting everybody the opportunity to play golf rounds. And so we thought it was better up front to say, no, you're gonna go on a waiting list. And I can tell you, in that time frame between now and last year, we've gotten 220 some people off the waiting list into memberships into the, into the Governor's Club. But we still have 200 on the waiting list. Um, we believe we've created space for Governor's Club rounds this year, I'll, I'll give you a number, and it won't mean anything to you, well, it might when I tell you this, that in 2019, I think we played 143,000 golf rounds on all five courses. In 2021, we played 208,000 rounds. That's averaging 50,000 rounds, I mean, 40,000 rounds per golf course. That's a huge number. Um, so, of those 200 some thousand rounds last year, and this may be more information than you want, but if you remember coming out of 2008 and 2009, the golf industry and the resort industry was down, way down. And everybody had to try to work to get people to come back to their golf courses. So you created playing opportunities um, for groups, groups that are tournaments, um, fundraisers, things like that, trying to get people to come in. Well, we looked at our plate, our golf round mix last year, toward the end of the year as we were getting ready to do the budget for this year, and we knew that we had about 15,000 rounds out of the 208,000 last year that fell into that category. Junior tournaments, college tournaments, uh, fundraising tournaments, a lot, there are about 15,000 rounds. So we decided not 
to re-up for those rounds this year, creating a 15,000 round hole that we were looking to fill with um, Governor's Club rounds if we get them. If, now, it isn't going to change the dynamic. We changed one other, one other dynamic for the Governor's Club. In prior years, you could only make a reservation seven days in advance. We've now made the reservations 14 days in advance. Um, so I know that there have been comments that Governor's Club members can't get tea times. Well, right now, at the end of April, you can't get a tea time. But it's been that way in April for the last 10 or 15 years, the last two weeks. It is the season for our golf resort and golf rounds and golf groups. They're the people paying the freight. And that kind of business allows us then in a business model to allow the Governor's Club to have it at a much reduced rate from what the general public gets who's not staying with us or the people who are staying with us. And that's the only way we can do it. I will tell you that if you, you do have an opportunity to make a tea time anytime you want, but if it's not two weeks in advance and it's further out, that tea time you'll have to pay the resort rate for it as opposed to the Governor's Club rate. But you can do it. That's just a choice you have to make. It may not be a choice you want to make, but is it a choice that is available? And I think you're all adults and you can make that responsible choice. Now, I'm saying that with a smile. I'm not trying to be a smart ass. Okay? So, we're very proud to have the Governor's Club. And also, um, obviously, if you want to join the Governor's Club social part of it, we have not stopped social memberships. Anybody can get a social membership, which allows you to have access to social events. You get the discount on food and beverage. You get the discount on uh, retail sales. You get all the benefits, except you don't have the opportunity to uh, have the full golf membership. And you can get on the list if you want to get in. So there's an opportunity. Before I go any further, I want to recognize Sarah Youngner, the director of the Governor's Club. I hired this woman when she was a younger woman who was just the most energetic, hardworking, intelligent, thorough person, and she's only gotten better. And um, I, you know, I'm blessed to be able to say that she's the director of the Governor's Club, and she's hired two wonderful women to join her in her office and, uh, with Brooke. And it's very unusual for golf course restaurants to be that successful. So we're really proud of the team out there and what they do and how they do it. Um, the next is in 2021. Did I skip one? No. Next is the, the cottages out at the ocean course. If you haven't seen them, you need to walk by and look at them. They, they're four <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Four cottages, Stern designed them. They're four bedrooms, four baths, with a living room and a and a, a kitchen. That's the porches. These are right off the tee, right off the driving range tee. That's the uh, living room area. It's got four recliners. Yeah, we're guilty. We assume most of them will be men. Now, I'm sorry. We. We had a long discussion. Our interior designer was a woman, and she agreed. So I figured we were covered. But we do have a, a sofa. If you see that back wall there, that's a sofa with, with uh, footstools. Um, and this is looking the other way to the, uh, the counter in the, in the kitchen area. It doesn't have a stove, but it's got microwave and dishwasher and ice machine. It's where people who go on a golf trip want to collect together at the end of the day. We'll cater food into there to them. Um, we'll build a bar for them, whatever. We'll create an experience that they'll remember forever. And we're running about 75% occupancy on those in this first year that we've had since the uh, PJ Championship, which is really good. And this is the ups one of the upstairs bedrooms. And between this bedroom and the one on the other side, there's a porch, an outdoor porch that you can go out and sit, see the ocean, hear the ocean. Um, so we've been very happy with the cottages. In 21, we also built a bike path and walking path from 
what is known as Pete Dye Drive, that road that runs up to the left. In red is the new bike path. What it did is it took pedestrians and people on bikes off of the road going into the clubhouse. Um, we shared the, the cost of this with the community association because part of it was on their land and part of it was on our land. We thank them for that, but we've solved a safety problem out there that people can ride their bike or walk out there safely and we don't have to worry about it because it's a blind turn either going off or coming on there. <coughs> upcoming projects that we have upcoming. Night Heron, we have a, the market and cafe. We're going to call it, rather than calling it the Night Heron Market, we're going to call it the Nest. We had a contest among our staff and said, give us suggestions. And the Nest in the park creates a warm gathering place. Yeah, I had that reaction too. <laughs> but we're going with it for now. It's called the Nest. Um, and then we have a fitness center and uh, the Camp Kiowa area. And the, um, in Night Heron Park, this is the site plan. You can see the market on the, um, the larger market. And then next to it is the existing pavilion that's there that we've renovated. We've reno renovated, we added bathrooms and changing areas for the kids in Camp Kiowa. Um, we changed all, we repainted everything, we, we fixed the floor, we've created almost a new area for the kids for Camp Kiowa that they've really been enjoying already in there. And then on the back side of that pavilion is where we've built a new fitness area. Now it's not big, but it's got everything I believe that you'd need. It'll be open to resort guests and governor's club. We're not going to man it initially. If you want to go work out there, Sarah is going to post a, a keypad code that you'll go there, punch in the keypad code, go in and work out, and leave. And please close the door. Um, and I'd say, probably without saying, please don't share this with people who aren't members. Yeah. Okay. This is a benefit to the members. We want to keep it that way, and we don't want it to be abused. This is kind of an aerial view. This is a rendering of the, uh, the nest there on the right. This is it under construction at this point. If you go over there, you'll see the construction. It's going to have a beautiful color uh, palette. It's going to sit beautifully in the site and blend with it with the trees and everything around it. This is a view from the existing parking lot where you walk in toward the uh, um, pavilion and the nature center. And this is it under construction. This is one picture of the um, fitness center. Those are the, we have the incumbents. We have the, uh, what are those? Um, Treadmill. Treadmills. I knew that's what it was. Thank you. And. There's other equipment in there. Obviously, we have free weights, we have dumbbells, we have uh, machines, um, and all of it's got those huge windows around it, so you get a lot of light, and uh, it's really going to be a nice place if you want to work out. This is the interior of the, uh, the nest. Again, it'll be, um, you come up the counter, place your order, then you'll go back to the counter to pick it up and take it to your table. It won't be paper plates or anything. It's going to be a hard, harder plate. It's not breakable, but it'll be more sustainable. The, you'll find out the best part of this building will be the porch. I think the porch is about 20 feet. So we're going to have tables up by the railing and tables on the backside. And you can sit out there, you look at the park. The setting is unbelievable. And in the area where you see the, the guy in the service window back there, there will, will be baking fresh bakery goods every day. And the smell there will be phenomenal. Our pastry chef for the villa area is so excited about it. Have you ever been to, um, oh gosh, I'm going to lose the name of it. I'll come back to it. Sarah, what's that place on, uh, uh, not similar, Caviar and Bananas is one of them. That's close. 
the bakery one on uh, Folly Road. Baguette? Yes. Ma baguette magic? Baguette magic. My wife took me there and I said, this is what I want it to be like. And so I went to our bake, uh, pastry chef and I said, have you been there? She said, no. She said, went there and she came back and says, that's what we want it to be like. So we're going to steal from other people what they do. You know, good ideas are worth repeating. So that's what we're going to do. And we're looking forward to all of that. You really don't want to talk about this. So let me just... Look, I'm going to be straight. I, I've, every time I've done this presentation, I said I'll never, I'll never lie to you. I'll never make stuff up. I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't have approval for anything at West Beach right now. And those of you who've been there have been working through it for, well, I started working it right after the PJ Championship in 12. And pushing and pushing and pushing. And we've gotten to different points in the process. And this is one thing about the ownership that... Um, is one of the best things about them, and for me, one of the most frustrating things about them is they don't need to do this. They're not looking to necessarily make a living off of this. This is what they're gonna do, they're gonna do it right, it's gonna be a first class product and it's gonna survive for a long time and they wanna make sure they get it right. So I'm gonna share with you some of the ideas that didn't make it. <laughs> but the reason I'm gonna show you that is I wanna at least give you a sense of what the quality standards are, of what, the, the, what the, the conditions are and what we're trying to accomplish there. Some of these were um, decided not to do because the mass was too big. It took up the whole site and it was, we're worried about mass, we're worried about open space, we're worried about the impact on the, we're trying to create a village feel down there. And so the site isn't that big. So we're trying to get it right. So without further ado, this is West Beach. These are the parcels at West Beach that we own that are under, now the one over there with the tennis courts, that's no longer tennis courts, obviously, that's where this building is. But parcel 20 at the bottom is actually the dune field there that we own and it's zoned for parks. So we can put pools and um, at, uh, recreational activities. There's still a whole, when I say the dune field, it's not the primary dune. There's still a lot of dune field left, but it's, it's an area that we can put pools and stuff and we intend to do that. The rest of the parcel, uh, I can't even see it. Parcel 20, or 22 AB, let's see. Okay. Parcel 2B, 2A, these are the parcels, and 2C, these are the parcels that we are looking to develop a the hospitality hotel slash um, rooms product down in West Beach. And um, this is what it looks like now. It's not attractive. We've tried to do some stuff around the outside fence. The fence right now, we've had a lot of wind storms. We're trying to get it put back up. And eventually we'll get started so we can get the fence in a different format. We're looking to, to create a kind of entry that will be traditional and um, southern. Everything is about southern traditional. And this was one idea to create whatever the front of the building is that it looks like a house. And the other buildings are going to like, like um, out parcels of the house. This is one of the ideas we started with. That concept is surviving right now as we look to design other things. This this, one of the other factors that we're doing, we want to create an axial relationship between the front door of the clubhouse at Cougar Point and the front door of this building so that you can walk out and walk across the street and have it set up so that you can get across and it create um, uh, a column, uh, not a colonnade, but a, um, a row of trees so that everything is treed there and it just feels like you're driving through this canopy of trees. This is kind of a simple idea of the architecture. This is what Stern sees as the architectural style for the buildings down there. Um, the big porches um, and, and the, the same kind of style we've done here. This was a three, the other one, was a, this is a three wing hotel. 
But we're not doing a three-wing hotel because of the massing of it. We didn't like it. This was a rendering of what the three-wing hotel could look like. But going to three wings, we had to put rooms in a fourth floor, and so we didn't like the height of the building. We didn't want to have to go that high. And this is just another design of the way the building could be configured. This was a loser. <laughs> Didn't go very far. I think it was half of a meeting one time when we brought it to him. Um, this one didn't work. These were just basically <clears throat> kind of like villa buildings. Um, and this one was all buildings spread around the site. So those are the kind of ideas that we have rejected. We are in the process right now of um, an idea that I think is, and I'm not going to say it. I've said over and over, I think we've got it, I think we're there, and it never happens. So I'm just going to say we're working hard at it, and when we, f we will announce it when it's here so that you all know it. It won't be a secret. We'll let you know, but it's not ready yet, and that's why we haven't done anything with it. I wanted to go over quickly to the next few slides and talk about what property do we own on the island and off the island in relationship to everybody else's property. Um, I believe right now we're the largest property owner on the island uh, with, the, with the sale of most of the property by the, um, uh, the developer. We're the only one that has property left. So this map, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not big. All of the items in green, land we own. Most of it is our golf courses, the golf course property and developed property. Um, the dark green is East Beach and the, san the sanctuary area. I'm going to see if there's a better map. This is, this is the sanctuary parcel that we own. In purple, that's the sanctuary hotel. The green on top of it, I'm going to see if you can see this. Oops. Ah, can you see that? I bet you can't. <laughs> okay, it goes over here. There, right there. That's East Beach. So we'll tear down and clear that out and have that. We own that pond, that parcel. That pond is um, on our property, and it gives us the flexibility. As you build on that, uh, on that land, you have to compensate for drainage and water and everything you have to do. So it gives us the flexibility to move it around so that we get the coverage that we need, but do it in a, in a responsible way of within the land plan and with um, making sure that we have, it's, not, it's nothing we have control over. The, the agencies come in and say, you have to do this much for this development. And that's what we'll do. The, um, this parcel to the west, where is it? Look at the purple one and to the left. <laughs> okay, those two parcels we own, and that's next to windswept. It's that blank piece of land from windswept to the sanctuary. That's our land. Um, one of the the when the, you may not know this, but when the sanctuary was built, the original design for the sanctuary was a three-wing hotel, so it had an additional wing on it. All of the public spaces and the group spaces were built to support a three-wing hotel. So if the decision was made at some point in the future that we don't have enough rooms, we need more rooms to take care of the volume of business, we can add that third wing without having to do anything with the uh, um, public space size or the group room size. So that opportunity exists. So that's at East Beach. This is the ocean course. This is the land we own at the ocean course that is not golf course land. Parcel 12 up at the top over there, I would identify that as in this last tournament, the PJ Championship, that was where CBS compound was. We bought that parcel from the partners. It has development rights. I think we can put 22 single family homes there or something like that. But our intention is not to sell it, but to use it for future events, which we anticipate having. And 
because of the scope of these tournaments and the, kind, the amount of land they need to be able to execute the tournament, we can't afford to give up that land. And so that's going to, um, that'll remain there. Now it's got a, a, um, a stone base right now and we're gonna go in and put uh, mulch over it. So it, it softens the look up there and doesn't look like it's a parking lot sitting there. So we'll be, we have piled the mulch out there and eventually we'll have it spread out. Um, the, the green area there is, um, allows up to 20 cottages if we wanted to build 20 cottages there or, or single family homes. And then you have um, Willet Island that we own that has development rights also. I don't expect that in this generation or the next generation the family to ever be developed as long as they own it because again the land is too valuable to the events that we want to have there. So I see that as being something that won't go. And this land is what we own at Andell. Andell East and Andell West. Total is just under 500 acres. And um, We have some plans for that. And I know, well, I'm not going to, I'm teetering on whether or not to talk about the annexation stuff or not, and I don't know that that would be productive at this point, so I'm just going to leave it. We came to the town, and no, I won't, we came to the town, so you understand, we came to the town to, tr to talk about annexation because we were faced with, we either get annexed and deal with the town's planning department and the community or we go to the county. We're currently under the county authority. And we can go to the county right now and work through them with what planning we'd like to do for this. We, are, we came to the town for the simple reason that because of the history we have together, with all the development we just showed, and the fact that the family's been here, well, they'll celebrate their 30th year of owning property on Kiowa in 2023. They started in 1993 buying portions of it and finished the purchases in 1996, which includes almost all of these parcels that I just showed you. So we felt because of that relationship that we would sit down and say, These are what, this is what we want to do. Now, I, I'll, I'll grant you, the presentation that we made didn't offer anywhere close the detail we've talked about with the other projects we've done. And I think that that's a valid criticism. But there's kind of a chicken and egg thing here. You don't want to go into a process of really spending money planning unless you know that you're going to be able to do what you want to do when you get it annexed. So it's, it's a challenging thing. I'm making the case that we can go ahead and plan because one way or another we're going to do it and if the town doesn't want to do it and they don't want to annex, we'll go to the county and we'll deal with them. So anything that would ever come back to the town right now in terms of wanting to talk about annexation would come back with much better developed planning so you can understand what it is. Um, an interesting thing about the county, I mentioned workforce housing. The, um, the county right now is giving developers an incentive that if they'll build workforce housing, they'll allow up, allow up to 18 units per acre to do workforce housing. That's basically apartments. And to do that, they'll allow that because they recognize and the people in this county understand that work, places for people who work in the jobs that we have for them are finding it difficult to get a place to live that they can afford. And so we have to find a way to deal, you know, businesses like ours, at some point we're gonna be subsidizing housing to help them so that we can get the workers we need. So um, that's very appealing to look at that. We probably won't build or manage the apartments, but we'll get into, into a partnership with somebody who will, and we'll guarantee them the um, rooms. We'll guarantee them the renters, because we'll have, but I don't think we'd be the only ones looking for it. I think the people at the club, I think the people at the town, I think the people at Seabrook, I think the people at Freshfields, they're all, their employees are all looking for a place to live that's closer to work and would help everybody. So one way or another, I believe this is going to get done.
2021 PJ Championship. How many of you were out there? Awesome. How many of you thought it was eh, okay? How many of you thought it was really great? Yeah, me too. So those of you who weren't there, this is more for you than, than them, but there were some unique things about the 21 PGA. Having been involved, obviously, for the last 30-some years with the PGA of America, I have had a lot of experience with events, championships, and all of that. And so I know I'm biased. This was the best one ever <laughs> for a number of reasons. And I'll elucidate. Um, we did fewer people because from a COVID standpoint, we couldn't make the commitment to sell it out because we didn't know what was gonna happen with COVID and who could come and what the standards were gonna be until about a month before, six weeks before. So we had about 50 to 60% of the normal number of spectators there. That turned out to be a blessing. It was a great experience for the people that were there. It made traffic easier to handle, plus the changes we made on the entry road with the left turn, the, the lanes, right turn lanes, left turn lanes, was, it was easier to manage. And so the whole thing worked. And I think that the PGA learned from it and it's a, a model they'll follow in the future. Next time they'll double the price of the tickets, but keep half, but keep half of the, uh, the number of people coming to make sure that financially, because part of the problem is they gotta cover the purse. And the purse for the Masters this year was $20 million. The winner got $2.7 million as a purse. Our purse was 11. So by the next time it gets here, they gotta find a way to pay for the purse. They may end up having a title sponsor. They've never wanted to do a title sponsor for the PGA, but it's very likely that they'll have to have a title sponsor to, to infuse cash into it to cover the purse. I just want to give you some remembrance pictures. This is uh, practice rounds, and you can tell it's practice rounds because they're all in shorts. Out by the range. This is a, just a shot at night of the beautiful clubhouse and the guy mowing, rolling the greens. This is the uh, sky boxes on 17. This is the die club as the sun was setting at the end of the day. No. Wrong. It is the die club, but... I, it may be the sun coming up. I can't tell what side we're on. I think it is sunrise. Okay. What'd you say, Sarah? Sunset. Sunset. Okay, there you go. The definitive answer. <laughs> um, this is looking up 18 from back by the uh, end of the hospitality area. This is an iconic picture. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Phil Mickelson, just as he finishes putting all the people out there, this will be the picture that will remind people of the 21 championship forever. And I'm glad they can't see that it's Phil. <laughs> Phil, has, Phil has hurt himself. It's self-inflicted. And um, I'm sorry to see that because he set a record. He deserves the adoration for the job that he did at this tournament. And I think time will heal all wounds and he'll be welcome back in the fo fold um, someday. Will there be another PJ Championship at the Ocean Course? Yes. yes. <laughs> now the normal question would be when? <laughs> well, if you look on their website, the first available date for the next PGA Championship is 2031. Yeah, that's what I said. Oh, I started adding it up. You know, when you get older, you try not to assume anything. Um, but we are um, in discussions with them about 31 and uh, hope to have something to announce in, in the future. But um, I'm fairly certain that we're going to get another one. And we're going to try, we're working with them, to, we're trying to get um, the 2026 Women's PGA Championship. Um, they, yeah, and their sponsor is KPMG. And KPMG, as the sponsor, they, um, they want to go to sites where they can, they work hard to um, bring seminars and speakers 
that work specifically to help promote women in industry, women in um, the C-suites and women into the leadership positions. And they've wanted to do it mainly at um, uh, metropolitan areas that have a lot of uh, opportunities. But we're going to try to convince them that, you know, do that the other years. Come here and have a good time. <laughs> and we've got enough people. And we've got enough people who will come and be a part of their seminars here who would be great speakers and great leaders to identify with. And so um, we're, we're working to do that. I don't know if it's going to happen. It's really up to KPMG. So if any of you are former CEOs or C-level people at KPMG and you want to put a, put a bid in, that'd be helpful. That's the end of my formal presentation. I'm willing to take questions as long as you want to ask them. And I have Sarah and um, Amy Cook. Okay, they have, they have microphones. They'll come and give it to you so everybody can hear your question. So if you want to raise your hand while somebody else is speaking, we can. Hey, Roger. Um, what do you plan to uh, develop? What type of development do you plan to put in where the marketplace is now? Can you turn up the microphone a little bit? I don't think I could. Can you, can you hear this one? Yeah. Okay. Dana, what'd you say? Um, where we have East Marketplace now, what do you plan to do there? What are the plans for development there? We don't have any plans currently other than we have the opportunity through our development agreement. And our development agreement with the town um, goes through 2027. Uh, we have, that is, that it can be used for um, either residential sales or resort. We could build product that we would rent as the resort. We just haven't decided what we want to do with it yet. We don't typically build for sale. Our ownership doesn't want to give up rights to the land. So if we build, we build for a commercial purpose. And um, as the villa product on the island continues to age, and as it, um, you know, it's up to the owners to upgrade, to bring it up to standard, we see ourselves moving more to building our own and managing our own as opposed to others so that we can, uh, we can assure the quality. So that's, that's probably where it'll go. Yep. Other question? Uh, yeah. Uh, first, I commend you on the, the development you've laid out. Um, is there or has there been traffic studies done uh, prior to each and every one of these? I'll talk specifically about Night Heron Park. Because as you make a right off of Keough Island, uh, the road, the bicycle path is right there. There's obviously going to be more traffic in that area, I assume. And have there been traffic studies that have been accomplished prior to all the development? Yeah, the answer to that is yes. Every project that we've done, um, one of the studies that we've required, and actually the planning bodies who we have to get approval for permits and everything require those traffic studies to show what the impact is going to be on traffic in the area. And we have not gotten a traffic report that says you can't do that project there because of the, the difficulty or dangerous situation with the traffic. So yes, we did have a study done there. And I, when you ask your question, can you let me know who you are? I'm Kathy Hill. I wonder what about the parking at Night Heron Park. Yeah, the question was wondered about the parking at Night Heron Park. As you know, we have um, we have parking there already. So the only use that's changing would be the market. And the market is a steady low flow during the, during the day. We're adding 47 spaces to the parking lot that's closest to the parkway, Key Island Parkway. We're going to repave and add spark parking spaces that are on the other side, on Seaforest side. So we're going to create better parking opportunities and, and uh, uh, more over there to accommodate the increased traffic. Yeah, we, look, we get it. <clears throat> we know what the issue is. We know that people, hey, I, there's a lot of traffic on this island. <laughs> I get that. But there's, there's going to be. There was always intended to be. By the number of lots that were available, by the number of multifamily units that were built, all of us who've been here over 20 years, we've just seen that progression. 
we shouldn't have been surprised because it was there to do, it was part of the plan, and the only thing that we um, had to make sure we were doing was that it was building according to code and building according to the plans. So there are times that it's bad. I think there's going to get some work done on the entryway to <coughs> excuse me, to the gate and so forth to try to move traffic. Look, it's not fun trying to get on the, on the island in the morning when people are coming to work. It's not fun at 5 o'clock to try to get off the island with the stop sign there. But it will be better, based on the newest plan that we've seen from the town, that that'll be a drive-through right lane, and you won't have to stop. And they'll create a more controlled left turn. So there are plans being made to make it as good as it can be, but there are limitations. And we'll just all have to live within those limitations, it appears. Yes, sir. Hi, Roger. My name is Russ Berner. Thanks for your time. Um, everything that you've said today is the reason why I came to Kiowa. It's a great place. It's a five-star resort. And I have more of a comment at this point rather than a question. Um, I'm one of those pickleball people that you talked about. I spend a lot of time at Roy Barth, and the comment I have is while the rest of the island pretty much is five-star, Roy Barth is really in need of help. And that's what I'm talking to you about right now. Um, I know you have plans for pickleball courts, and that's great. The ones I play on right now literally have cracks in them. Um, Seabrook has better facilities. Hilton Head has better facilities. Myrtle Beach has better facilities. Um, the planter boxes at Roy Barth are falling apart. Roy Barth really needs your attention because there's going to come a time where you're going to be getting negative reviews and it's going to hurt the island. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yes. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Pete Krinkovich. Um, with the prospective development of the Andel properties, where will you have parking for the next PGA tournament? That's a really pertinent question. We'll never get that whole part. We are not developers. <laughs> Frankly, we're just not. Um, so if you think it's taken long to get West Beach done with something we want, um, I, I don't anticipate. There will be some small projects there, but we will, we've committed, we'll keep 100 acres, 150 acres always for parking for the events so that we can continue to have these major championships. And our board is committed to that. So that's a priority. Keeping the parking's a priority and we'll probably land plan it so that that's always where we can use it and plan around that until something better comes along. But I, that, that's a good question. Roger, Andy Capelli. Uh, I, I'm sure you don't need another selling point, but with respect to 31, you might want to remind your friends down in uh, Orlando or nearby uh, that it's the 40th anniversary of the Ryder Cup. It would be nice if the dates were. I've out. already done that. I'm sure you have. I'm looking for every angle, Andy, every angle. We've the, talked to them about it. The second point. Uh, which might help the new chairman at KPMG is a golfer. So uh, as opposed to the previous one, you might have a, a leg up there with him. That's good to know. I didn't have that intel. I'll use that. There's a question up here, Sarah, up at the front. Thank you, Neil, with the one project. I'm John McMurray. Just a question, is there any discussions about adding a new golf course, another golf course, possibly even a par three, which would call, be less maintenance cost and less property needed? We, um, I probably wouldn't support building a nine hole golf course simply because I've been in this business for about 47 years and I've never seen a nine hole golf course that would pay for itself. So I'd rather build an 18 because I know that we can sell 18 holes. And yes, we are right now in the process of looking we have land um, that's not at Andell, but is close. It's over by Oak that we own. And, um, but we don't own enough 
of high ground to build an 18-hole golf course. We'd have to see what we can do with acquiring uh, contiguous property to be able to do it. But um, one of the things we've talked about, we are, we just don't know right now if the 208,000 rounds last year and the 194,000 rounds that we've budgeted for this year, we don't know if this is a COVID bubble or if it's the way the future is going to be or are we going back down. If we go back down to, to prior round counts, then we don't need to build one. If we stay where we are, we're going to need to build a golf course because we're going to build a product with 150 bedrooms that's going to need a place to play. So we will be, we will be, we take this from a, obviously a purely business standpoint and that kind of decision would re return. It would create an ROI that would be worth it to do it. It's just getting it to get planned together. Ultimately, um, and this is a little inside baseball, it, don't repeat it, um, especially on IKEA. Um, <laughs> We would, like, we would like to create a situation where we would put the, the clubhouse for the new golf course and for Oak on Betsy Carrison so that we could access both golf courses out of one clubhouse. We'd probably have to reroute Oak so that we could tie it to the clubhouse, but we'd have two golf courses there working out of one clubhouse. And um, that gives us some flexibility there too in the transition period about how we want to um, use the golf course we built we would intend to build a another first class golf course and then during the we would probably finish that golf course and then close oak for a period and really do some significant renovation to it to bring it to the standard even though that the, the it's one of my favorite places to play just because it's a challenging golf course but those are the that's the way we're thinking we know from a business perspective if we're going to continue to have growth in governor's club and we're going to have to provide golf that we're going to have to uh, spend the money and do the golf courses so yes that that's something we would do um with regard to the uh, andel property is there any plans for a new grocery store <laughs> how'd you know about that yes yes there is um, I don't, I don't want to um, step in front of the people who are doing the project by, by announcing anything, by saying anything. I would just say that those of us who don't fully enjoy the grocery experience in, in um, fresh fields right now will be happy to know that that's not a long-term situation. Longtime Governor's Club member. Uh, the number of 200 on the waiting list is very large and alarming. And I know that when I look back at some of the previous directories, the Governor's Club directory, they were stapled together. Now we have to go out and have them bound because we have so many pages to it. My question is in a, a, a hope. I wonder if you have a plan for bringing those people into the Governor's Club. Is there a priority? for people who live on the island or own property on the island rather than for outsiders who may live in Somerville or Hollywood or North Charleston. And if you look at the directory, there are several like that. And they, they own nothing, they give nothing back to us except you get revenue for the uh, use of the golf course. Well, the question, um, I was, I'm a little confused by it because you have to own property on the island to be a member of the Governor's Club. Unless your didn't. I didn't hear you. Unless, your didn't. Unless they were here as property owners and were members of the Governor's Club and left, there are a few, after a certain date, we didn't grandfather people after that, but those who had been here early, we grandfathered them. They don't do a lot, but <clears throat> you have to be a property owner on Kiowa to be in the Governor's Club. And that's the policy now. Now, getting people off of the um, list. As I said, last year we got 223 people off of the waiting list. And we've just added up to 200. Um, we need to see what's going to happen with the play this year, but as we see that we have enough rounds that we're not creating another negative situation, obviously it's in our best interest to get them on the, 
on the rolls from a business perspective, as you said, um, but we won't do it till we think it's the right time to do it from an impact on everybody else that's here, and we're committed to that. Um, we have currently 1,700 memberships that represent 5,000 people in the governance club, family members and everything. So that gives you a perspective of what we're dealing with, and that's fine. Um, we're happy that we have that club. We want to continue with that club. There's always been, I think, over the time that I've been here, some concern that that's something that we don't want to do, and that's not true. Um, and, I, and I want you to tell, if I get upset with you at times, Sarah is your advocate. She's always advocating and making me clear on where I'm wrong. So um, I think you're in good shape. And I hope you're enjoying it. And we're going to continue to try to make it a great experience for you. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was asking if there were any plans for any more pools. The pool situation is pretty crowded. Well, how do I answer this? <laughs> yes, there's plans for more pools. Will Governor's Club members necessarily be able to get in those pools? To be determined. All of the stuff that we'll build down at West Beach, there will be pools there. Um, and we anticipate that that will um, be open to, it's open, it'll be open to uh, obviously um, resort guests and based on the size we build that we'd anticipate that there would be some access to Governor's Club. Um, I'm, not, I'm a little bit confused about the, um, the access to pools right now being tight. Where are you specifically talking about? Yeah, that's Easter weekend. That's not, a, that's not a representative experience for the rest of the year, but it was for that week. And that was a miss. We're not, we we're not going to defend that we didn't have the, the chairs or the towels, but I'm not, I don't think I'd base a judgment on the, the pool availability based on Easter weekend. Uh, Sue Ellen Hannon. In the scheme of things, this is a little bit of a minor detail, but speaking of Knight Heron uh, pool, you're doing some magnificent things to Night Heron Park and, and the new market. Night Heron Pool needs some upgrades seriously. The restrooms, the furniture, all of the, um, the towels, everything is really, we were there and yes, it was crowded and I understand that, but the actual ambiance of the pool itself needs to be upgraded for you to look at. Thank you. Was that a question? No. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Oh, one more. One more. Sorry, one more. Two more. These are the last two. Diane Later here. Um, is it safe to assume that the resort has no plans to sell off any of its undeveloped parcels? That is a very, very safe assumption. Uh, there have been rumors floating around, and you've probably heard them, so thank you for that. Hadn't heard that one. No, we're not going to sell. Hey, I'm, I'm David Petron. I have two questions about food at the nest. Number one, are you going to have pizza like you've had at the market? And number two, and this is very important to my wife, my wife comes down here, she looks forward to going to Night Heron Park and getting those cheddar cheese fries. And she was over there earlier this week, and there were no cheddar cheese fries on the menu. And she was very upset, and I had to hear about it. So I want to know if we're going to get the cheddar cheese fries back. Well, no, there's not going to be any pizza at the nest, but there will be takeout pizza available at Turtle Point. We've created a pizza kitchen in there, and we're going to have takeout pizza at Turtle Point. And the cheese fries, uh, maybe. <laughs> I'm not going to commit to something that somebody's going to tell me why it's not a good idea, so I'll say maybe. 
Thank you all. Have a good rest of your day.